My name is Shelby Nelson, and I'm the executive director here at Clay County Heritage. Um, so thank you guys all for coming today. This is probably one of our best turnouts this year for these Lunch and Learn programs. Um, they do happen on the last Wednesday of every month. Um, so next month in October, we'll have Jeremy Parsons from the Clay County Fair here to talk about fairground history. Um, and then in November, we're going to have David Cruz here. Um, his topic is to be decided yet. Um, so hopefully you guys can come join us for that. But otherwise, we have Diana Coffin here. Um, we've been working with her a lot to get this exhibit up about for her aunt. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's been really fun, and I think it turned out wonderful. So I'll let Diana take it away. And Thank you. We're Thank you, Shelby. Go. Yeah, it's, oh, I'm oh, totally flattered. <laughs> totally flattered that I get to be the one that tells her story. <laughs> well, I retired from Spencer as a uh, Spencer teacher. This is my first time as an author. Last November, my sister Pam and I published our aunt's memoir, and we are so grateful to have this opportunity to share our aunt's mission with you. We think you will see that the exhibit that's here at the Clay County Heritage Center shines a light on an influential role a woman with local ties had to the civil rights movement. Now, if this will work for me, okay. Through my presentation today, you will not only witness how a white woman from Cylinder, Iowa, could be so important to civil rights history, but you will understand the importance of books as well as hear about our book writing process. I hope this presentation will encourage you to bring others to see our aunt's exhibit that will be here till mid-December. Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave from Maryland, known for his anti-slavery writings in the 1800s, once stated, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Throughout my life, I have witnessed the power of words and how they can inspire hope and bring about healing. My sister Pam and I collaborated on writings for people in need of a boost or in need of a reminder of their impact on others. Even though we enjoyed writing, Pam and I never planned to have anything published until four years ago. In 2017, at the age of 90, our aunt, Mary and Helen, and her husband, David, moved from Minneapolis area to Spencer. Back in the 1970s, as an interracial couple, when Mary and David moved into their Minnesota home, they endured fences for cell signs popping up in the neighborhood. So the move in 2017 was especially a scary one. They chose Spencer because of the central location between Marion's brother and Cylinder and her sister in Spirit Lake. I even found an old newspaper clipping announcing Spencer named the list of America's best small towns where Marion noted the following at the top. To confirm you picked the right one. Their Minnesota house sold very quickly and they had one weekend to pack and move. They only had three small vehicles to hold their belongings, so they left many items behind. However, they made room for over 50 boxes filled with historical mementos our aunt had saved throughout her life. When Aunt Marion arrived in Spencer, she gave these boxes to my sister Pam and me because she knew as teachers we would use her materials with our students. Even at the age of 90, Marion wrote out the suggested lessons for each box that you see pictured here. <laughs> when our aunt passed away in 2018, our family turned to us to write her obituary. What a special yet challenging task. We were tasked, taxed with sharing all that that little dash separating the date of her birth and the date of her death encompassed. This was definitely our most important writing task to date, for our aunt's 91 years of life had impacted so many. How could we put this into a couple of pages? We had one day to pour through those 50 boxes to properly share Marion's accomplishments with friends and family. To add to the challenge, Pam was in Tennessee, and the boxes were with me here in Spencer. So I took and sent the pictures of much of the contents to Pam. And with each photo sent, our aunt's narrative expanded. 
we posted our aunt's obituary on the Warner Funeral Homes website. Within, within hours, we received the following comment from someone that didn't even know Marion or us. This beautiful written obituary reflects the light of a life so well lived. I did not know Marion more's a pity. Even her obituary was forwarded to me this evening by a friend. It, like Marion, has gained a life of its own. What a life, what a woman, what a human being. And he had never met her. Due to the outpouring of the responses we got from Marion's obituary, we knew that these primary sources contained in those 50 boxes, covering over a century of civil rights service, needed to be shared with the world. The first things that caught our attention were our aunt's photos that paralleled events we had read about in school, but even as teachers, we had never seen photos like these. There were letters, journals, published articles, speeches, interviews, photos, tape recordings, and government publications, all documenting Marion's life she dedicated to human rights and helping others receive the same rights she wanted for herself. Our Aunt Marion's life goal was to eradicate the injustices of the world and help others analyze situations critical from multiple perspectives in order to make well-informed decisions. Marion knew that villains are not villains in their own eyes, as they have reasons behind their actions as much as the heroes. Therefore, it was her goal to place herself in the position of others to gain an understanding for their actions and to encourage others to do the same by being empathetic, even if they did not always agree. It was Mary Steele, who's here with us today, that took time to share publishing <laughs> tips with us, giving us the confidence to move forward. Because at this point, we only thought the book would be for our family. Marion encouraged us to go that next step. So we wrote and published Mary, or Mary did. We wrote and published Marion's memoir, knowing it offers a unique viewpoint into the civil rights movement from a Midwestern white school teacher's perspective, spanning over 90 years. Now, let's hear about Marion's story. This is one of the wall clings in the museum, created by Vanessa Moore, and it adds such depth to when you see the exhibit. We also need to thank Braden Feline for researching and organizing this exhibit, allowing for Vanessa to capture our hearts upon seeing this exhibit. In the 1920s, my grandparents with one set of great-grandparents traveled by ship from Norway to the United States in search of a great place to become farmers and to raise a family. Marion was born a year later in Minnesota, but soon moved to Iowa and was surrounded by Norwegian traditions. The photograph on the left is the Helen farmed in Cylinder, Iowa now. Marion's brother Orville and his wife Joanne still reside there today. At a very early age, Marion learned what it was like to be different. She spoke no English when she entered school of her first one room school near Wallingford followed by one-room schools in High Lake and Seneca. Marion knew her job was to learn English and quickly saw that learning to read was the key to her success. Marion had many responsibilities for a six-year-old. She wrote the family checks and served as translator on all of their business trips. Marion's classmates readily accepted her, but things were different for her brother Orville. When Orville started school, he got blamed for many of the bad things that happened since he did not know English and could not defend himself. Therefore, Marion and her brother made a pact that their little sister Gladys, my mother, would grow up with English as her first language. Thus, Marion's teaching days began as she, her, as she taught her family enough English to converse. Marion loved to read. Books and newspapers served as her link to the world outside her small community of Cylinder, Iowa. Reading was the living bridge to so many worlds. But the more she learned, the more questions she had. Marion's world was impacted by her personal experiences as a child of immigrant parents, as well as the words she read in the paper. In the 1930s, 
when Marion's teacher shared Uncle Tom's Cabin, a book about the bad treatment of slaves in the 1850s, Marion started to research how black people in the U.S. were currently being treated. Marion came home from school and she shared her concerns with her family. It was Marion's father who pointed out the deep-rooted, cruel, unjust treatment endured by some people in the South, and he warned his children, do not believe everything you read in those history books. Search for the whole story. From that day on, Marion critically examined her texts as well as every word she heard. Marion believed that once others got wind of the injustices, the problems would surely be fixed. In 1940, Marion read about the terrible treatment of Jewish people within her family's Norwegian newspapers. Adolf Hitler's warped ideas about a perfect race had infected Germany with hatred. Therefore, in her Cylinder High School valedictorian speech in 1944, Marion used the symbolism of a twisted twig to exemplify the warped ideas of Hitler as well as others that kept so many people from realizing their dreams. Listen to part of this speech, 17-year-old Marion. As a twisted twig sometimes develops into a bent tree, spoiling the symmetry of the forest, so sometimes a twisted idea finds root in the mind of man and develops a personality which spoils the beauty of man's dreams. It is my pleasure to have Joan Beckman and Jane Gokin here today because their mothers, Jean and Alice Kajewski, went to high school in Cylinder and were dear friends of Marion's and the Helen's family. Following her Waldorf graduation in 1946, Marion began to teach that began her teaching career in Bode, Iowa, and then Davenport, before moving to the Minneapolis area to teach. She found her avenue for pursuing equality by opening her students' eyes to the discrimination. Marion encouraged her students to celebrate individual differences and equip them with tools to dismantle hatred and ignorance. Searching from multiple perspectives was the key to awareness of what others were experiencing. Marion creatively made every life experience a teachable moment, and memories of Miss Helen have permeated her students' adult lives. You're going to meet some of them. Marion's class had class mottos. In 1963 and 64, the motto was, way to be. And at the end of the school year, Marion created a classroom poem to make each student feel important. Sue, you might know where I got those birthday poems from now. <laughs> Here's part of that speech, of, of her poem. Time is running out on my class of 64. It won't be long and you'll be rushing out the door. But before we say goodbye, auf Wiedersehen and adios, let me tell you what it is I will miss the most. Well, Marion kept in touch with many of her students, making it easy to contact them. In a Zoom interview with Jane, Jane shared that after a move to Minnesota in the fourth grade, Jane experienced an extremely difficult transition with students being mean to her. She went home in tears on a daily basis. Jane also remembered feeling that she stood out as one of the only Jewish students. However, in fifth grade, Jane made her way into Miss Helen's room and her world changed. Jane said, Miss Helen made everyone feel valued since she cherished unique strengths. Jane was even the first girl to be a patrol. She was quite proud of that accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> that year, students read books and created miniature book reports they stored in tiny folders. Jane, seated in her home in Virginia, instantly reached for her booklet and began sharing her fifth grade words from 1963. In the class poem, Marion wrote the following words in reference to Jane. For personality, talent, and a coruscating brain, I surely have to nominate my dark-eyed little Jane. Well, classmate Becky joined in that Zoom call from Minnesota. The words Marion shared about Becky in the poem were, sweet and polite is Becky, that jewel. She works and she tries and she follows each rule. As soon as both ladies joined in that Zoom call, you would have thought they planned this, but they exclaimed in unison, Miss Helen was my hero. 1963 was also the year President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. 
At the end of the school year, Marion gave each student the book, That Special Grace. Some 57 years later, both ladies sat proudly with tears in their eyes, displaying their copy. Jane pulled out a list of the vocabulary words Miss Helen had presented days before to help the students comprehend the author's poignant words. Now, on a side note, when those two girls showed girls, they were my age, but when those two girls showed their books, I remembered Marion having a box labeled Kennedy Books. So I then went downstairs and found this, this same copy of the book, and inside the back cover, all of her students had autographed that book. Um, that brought tears to Jane and Becky as well. I have a feeling each year she would give a book to her class at the, at the end of the school year. Now Richard was also in this class, and he too had his book and poem. Richard's lines in the poem were as follows. He sports a crew cut and has writing that blinds me. But for news and botany, I'll miss Richard Heine. Well, Richard had a keen interest in the news and was blessed to have Miss Helen to help him bring meaning to the world happenings. Richard carries memories of Marion with him today. Miss Helen was an excellent teacher. I remember the day Kennedy was shot. We were standing in line after recess when the word was passed down through the line. Many in the class were quietly sobbing. A terrible day. Beyond meeting the individual needs of her Minnesota students, Marion studied the events of the Civil Rights Movement and contemplated ways she could help. In 1964, President Johnson approved the Civil Rights Act to declare segregation and discrimination illegal. While reading her teacher's newsletter, Marion spotted an advertisement titled, Teachers Wanted to Teach Freedom. She stumbled upon the opportunity she had been seeking, the chance to teach youth how to make right the errors of the past. In the summer of 1965, after finishing teaching fifth grade in Minnesota that year, Marion drove from Minnesota to Gadsden, Alabama to open her first freedom school that summer. Marion instilled confidence within, in her students, disadvantaged by separate but equal school system. She visited many schools and stated, they are indeed separate, but there's nothing equal about it. The black schools do not have as good equipment as the white schools. And worse yet, the black books are discards from the white schools. To fully understand the problems facing the desegregation efforts, on her first day in Alabama in 1965, Marion sneaked into a Klan meeting at the local elementary school. Marion documented the following. I was shocked that they had records of Christian hymns playing as we marched in, and there were also young children in Klan outfits. To gain perspective, Marion attempted to talk to as many white Southerners as she dared. Some white people were friendly, but would not discuss the problem. Some were sympathetic, but warned her to be careful. And others let her know they disliked outsiders and would have no more to do with her. Well, Marion was not assigned a place to stay in Alabama. It was a very risky thing for black families to house the white civil rights workers because they did not know what consequences might come of it. After a few nights of sleeping in her car, a black woman kindly offered Mary in the house you see pictured here as a place to stay. Since it did not have electricity or running water, a neighbor allowed Marion to use their bathroom. Well, Marion knew that reading held the key to overcoming oppression and reaping the benefits of their new rights and freedoms. Marion was in a building where black children came to check out books and was wondering how to get a class organized. A young boy came shyly in to check out books. She talked with them and soon a few other boys and girls arrived. Marion asked if they'd like to sit at a table for an art class. They agreed thus pioneering her first freedom school that grew to about 20 students, ranging in age from preschool to eighth grade. She dared to teach academics forbidden in all black schools. She taught black history, voter literacy, political organization skills, along with reading and math. So you see, 
Marion and the students gave up their summer vacations to learn. Also with Marion by their sides, these students and their families gained the courage to desegregate the parks. However, the town closed their swimming pool that summer because they did not want them desegregated. Many blacks were afraid to register to vote because they might lose their jobs or even their lives. Marion noted the following in her journal. The white southerners discouraged people from registering to vote in many ways. They took benches out so people had to stand and wait. They closed at four o'clock. They registered only five days a month. As an added deterrent, the Ku Klux Klan positioned themselves outside the courthouse in an attempt to scare them away prior to registering. The challenges were definitely real, but a change could not transpire, and the laws would not be rectified unless the black community gained a voice in society. That voice could only be heard through voting. Marion noted that one of her Freedom School students, Pancho, had a knack for creating characters and plots. So they had singing, dancing, and wisecracking puppets. This was a great chance for Poncho to shine. When it was time for Marion to leave Alabama, Marion said, the last words I heard as I drove out of the yard behind the center were those of Poncho calling to me. Y'all coming back next summer? Poncho's words stuck with Marion for all the years that followed. To try to explain this movement to her Midwest students, Marion mailed letters to her Minnesota students describing her time in the South. Here's part of this letter. I, want to know, I wanted to know what the Civil Rights Movement was like, looking at it from the inside rather than just reading about it. Also, I wanted to talk to both blacks and whites in the South and hear from them what their lives are like and what their ideas are. The following summer, James Meredith scheduled a walk from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi to demonstrate if such a feat could be accomplished by a black man. Unfortunately, Meredith barely made it across the state line from Tennessee before he was shot. However, under the direction of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the peaceful march continued. Meredith joined the others after he was released from the hospital. Once school in Minnesota let out for the summer, Marion joined in that march. They registered more than 4,000 black people to vote. Marion described the tension, though, through pictures of onlookers, as well as stating this. Dr. King, Stokely Carmichael, and Andrew Young spoke at the foot of the courthouse in Jackson, Mississippi, with Klansmen present. National Guardsmen stood with rifles drawn, pointed at the marchers and the crowd. But Marion also noted the perspective of the onlookers, stating that as they were marching, many onlookers pointed to a creek as a reminder of the three civil rights workers who mysteriously drowned in the Pearl River the year prior. After that march, Marion went to Columbia, Mississippi to open her next freedom school and help integrate the local playground, tennis court, library, laundromat, and theater for the first time with Marion leading them in the history of Columbia. As with Alabama, Marion found the people of Mississippi were not following the civil rights laws, making black people afraid to go places that were once labeled whites only. While Marion was in Mississippi in 1966, two years after the passing of that law, she took photos showing blacks and whites were still separated. Here is a laundromat for black people, and across town was the whites only laundromat. This store has a door for blacks and a door for whites. At the bottom of this screen, you will see the white lib library on the left, and note how it compares to the black library on the right. With the trunk of her car full of books donated from her Minnesota school, as well as the car donated from her Minnesota school, Marion was equipped. Marion and her students transformed an old shanty into a library of over 500 books donated by educators across the nation. The students poured through these books and then visited the Black Library. Book selection for this library was controlled by an all-white 
library board. Marion understood that culturally inclusive books illustrating the black experience were not exist, non-existent, yet she took her students to the white library anyway, granting the children access to a resource previously barred from black people. With success, the students proudly left the library that day with library cards in their hands. Some of the children cried as they proudly grasped a library card with their very own names on them. Even though Marion worried that her students would not be able to use the cards again unless a white person was with them, she was happy that they were treated kindly at the library that day. Marion and her students took a field trip to the radio station, as well as venturing into the community to desegregate other areas. Marion and about 15 students integrated the white pool. The whole police force arrived, and the mayor met them there too. On another occasion, Marion and 13 students went to the playground to play frisbee. Two police cars were present, and all the whites instantly disappeared. And Pam and I are still trying to figure out why the police sang, we shall overcome. Freedom School teachers Marion and Lynn called home for that Columbia, Mississippi summer. This house made of boards and cardboard with no solid walls, no doorknobs, no running water. Marion saw what it was like to live in poverty, except for one thing. She knew she could go home to Minnesota anytime she wanted. While in the South, Marion's feeling of hopelessness was worse than fear of physical danger, Marion proclaimed, and I quote, no one down there could quite believe that we had gone to all that trouble for the sake of American idealism. Danger was always looming, but her students continued to come to school each day. Their school had been bombed and shot at the year before. And this year, hooded Klansmen rode up to their doors trying to intimidate them. I can't even imagine how that would feel for a student or a teacher. One night on their way home from the Freedom School, Marion and Lynn spotted a car following them. The two women heard the other car screech to a halt and they watched a couple of men approach their house Lynn, armed with a shotgun, leaned out of the car, and to scare the intruders away, fired a shot straight into the air. Something crashed to the ground, and the car peeled away. A paper bag full of shredded papers, along with a huge wooden cross, drenched in kerosene, was lying on their front lawn. Marion and Lynn hoisted it onto their hood of, their, of Marion's Freedom Fair Lane and drove to the headquarters where they spent the night. Even though it was such a risk to house these civil rights workers, another family allowed Marion and Lynn to stay at their home. This is the Duke family who continued to correspond with Marion through letters. In this 1967 letter, the Duke family was worried for Marion because they heard about riots going on in Minneapolis. In this 1968 letter, they were thanking Marion for money and supplies she sent. However, the box never arrived. Marion again chose to send a letter in 1966 to her Minnesota students. Here's a part of that letter. My class of teenagers and I went for a picnic in the White Park one day. The police came to watch us. All the white people in the park scurried off except some children who continued playing normally until their mothers drove up and hurriedly hauled them away. One short year after that summer in Mississippi, Ken entered Marion's class, leaving him with lasting memories. Miss Helen was my teacher from 1967 to 68, assassination year for MLK and RFK, intense year. I was fortunate to have her perspective with those events. She very much opened my eyes, and it has stayed with me my entire life. I still have my MLK photo book she gave each student. Marion's inscription included the following. This is supposed to be a country of ideas and freedom. This year we lost Dr. King and Robert Kennedy. We have work to do. And, and Kenneth allowed us to have his book. So we have that book now, too. After the happenings in Minneapolis in 2020, 
Ken reminisced about the impact Marion had on his life, stating, her passion for peaceful protest from a white suburban setting was very influential in my world, how she would be marching today. Gil's life was changed that same year. Your aunt changed my life for the better. She was perhaps the most impactful teacher I ever had. I publicly, publicly spoke about her a couple of years ago after taking a civil rights trip with my synagogue. I read her obituary before giving my presentation. I credit her with sensitizing me and teaching me so much at such a young age. Her example and teaching were profoundly formative upon me, and I will be forever grateful to have her in my life. Classmate Thomas noted, I could never tell you how much I appreciated Miss Helen. She was a great example for any of us students to follow. She will also be someone I will remember all the days of my life. Remarkable woman. We had an inner city school come out to Neal Elementary. They were in awe of how nice our school was. Then we went to their school and found out how nice we really had it. We were each assigned to a student. We were all just kids getting along and having fun with each other. I'm sure your aunt really appreciated that. That was the part of her that she passed on to us. Treat all people equally and with respect. I tell my son about her all the time. If I could, she would be the one teacher I would have loved to give a big hug. Love never fails, and I still miss her every time I pass by that school. After each summer of service, Marion returned to Minnesota, where she questioned how people could ignore what was going on in the South. Marion continued to work with the Civil Rights Movement along MLK. Her task now, though, was to help people in the Midwest understand what was happening in the South, and Marion said this was her toughest task. Marion kept all the letters MLK sent to her in the mail. MLK's letters suggested ways to instill change through marches and education. Unfortunately, Marion also experienced the moment in April of 1968 when the world lost this key civil rights leader. MLK traveled to Memphis, Tennessee to peacefully advocate for better conditions for sanitation workers and was shot and killed. But prior to his death, MLK initiated what was called the Poor People's Campaign a peaceful way to bring awareness to the poor living conditions of so many. Even though MLK was gone, the Poor People's March continued that year, and Marion took this bus on a 17-hour trip across country from Minnesota to Washington, D.C., to take part in the daily demonstrations. Marion built and lived for two months and a house made from scraps of wood on the Washington, D.C. lawn that they coined Resurrection City. These houses showed the rough conditions of the poor. Her summers in the South had shown Marion what it was like to live in poverty, and she wanted to help to find a way for people to get out of these conditions. Marion not only participated in the campaign, but she also worked with the youth. Marion even convinced the superintendent that you see in the lower picture here, that's Superintendent John B. Davis of the Minneapolis schools to come to DC, and he did, which will become important later on. <laughs> After the summer in DC, Marion had an eventful school year. In an interview with Carl in 2020, Carl described himself as a troublemaker during his elementary years. He often grew interested in the traditional classroom setting and spent most of his time in the hallway and time out prior to joining Miss Helen's class. In Miss Helen's class, Carl was relieved he could finally connect again. Marion developed projects, allowing Carl to delve deeper into the content while simultaneously involving all the other students in the process. Carl recalled, during that school year, there was a current controversy in the United States about whether the term Negro or Afro-American or black was most polite. We had a visitor come to our class, and Miss Helen encouraged us to ask any questions that came to mind of that visitor. What do you want to be called, Negro or Afro-American or black? A classmate asked. His answer was, I'd rather be called Henry. Well, Henry's answer to my classmate's innocent question really got me thinking. 
why not treat all of my neighbors as individuals, one at a time? Well, that same year, Carl decided to end a friendship with one of his fifth grade classmates because of the racist views his friend held. Well, Carl went to Miss Helen for support, but Marian surprised him. She told Carl that even if he fervently disagreed with his friend's beliefs, he should still be empathetic to his views. Well, this radical statement left a lasting impression on Carl. Well, in the letter we found about Carl that Marion had written, she wrote, I remember you as a creative and critical thinker before those concepts entered the school curriculum. Besides being a thinker, you were a doer. You wrote to the Minneapolis Tribune, defending the teaching of African American history in our schools. I cheered. It wasn't even an assignment. <laughs> Classmate Sandra also remembered that letter to the editor, among other life-changing activities. With the turmoil surrounding 1969, the class participated in a time capsule that Carl led, and in this activity gave the class an opportunity to look ahead and make a conscious effort to instill change. On a side note, Braden was able to set up a DVD that you can listen to their words about what they predicted in 1969 for 2001. Marion, Sandy, and the other classmates gathered in 2001 to open the time capsule. Moreover, Marion developed packets with her photos from the South, as well as DC, for her Minnesota students to complement their textbooks. Sandy shared keeping her packet for over 50 years and recalled, and I quote, a classmate's mother, along with two other women, came to examine our Afro-American history books. My vision of Miss Helen, though, at the time was one of calm, conviction. She stood her ground, and fortunately, the school, and we know the superintendent, stood behind her, and we were allowed to keep learning what we couldn't have learned anywhere else. Sadly for that student, his family took him out of our school. I've always felt sorry for him and have wondered if his eyes were ever open to the fact that we are all equal. Charles recalled, I remember being mesmerized by her stories. I felt very fortunate to have her, had her. I unlearned some of the racism I learned at home. She left quite an impression. During the Minneapolis happenings in 2020, on a Facebook thread, Charles referenced Marion with the following words. She woke a generation. She has been on my mind all week with what is happening in our city and in our nation. On to 1984, Brent stated, Marion was more than a teacher. She certainly has stories to tell. I learned so much from her that year. I will never forget about the slides that she would show us and we would watch from the Civil Rights Movement. She would narrate it and it was almost as if she was back there again. Miss Helen always said, follow your dreams. And bowling was one that she and I shared. We loved to talk about bowling when all the students were leaving at the end of the school day. You know, she took the whole class bowling one day. Well, Brent was pleased to hear that Marion's bowling trophies are here on display in the main part of the museum. But Brent continued to share with us. I now own a bowling center. <laughs> I went on and started an organization called Minnesota Junior Bowlers, and to date we have given out over a million dollars in scholarships to students since 1994. Miss Helen's class was like no other. We made a town and we all had a business and a checking account and spent money like a little city in a classroom. She had different desks set up for groups. No other class at Neil had these desks. Not sure how she got the budget for them, but when she talked, people listened. She was feisty, yet her humor was the best. Well, through our research, we found out that Marion was recognized with economic awards for the state of Minnesota for this unit called Learning Valley that she did with her fifth graders. After retirement, Marion not only spoke for Indian rights with an AIM, but she mentored middle schoolers, teaching them the essay writing process. Marion recognized that many living narratives needed to be heard from the indigenous community, and she wanted to equip the youth with the ability to put their ideas down on paper. 
Marion noted in 2001, the country is polluted by racist talk. This is in 2001. And Minnesota alone was averaging in that time over 200 hate crimes a year. So let's do something. In 2002, at the age of 75, Marion organized rehab to rehabilitate convicted offenders of hate incidents. Through the program, probation officers would contact Marion. She, in turn, met with the individuals, ranged from elementary school age to age 40. Despite being about a 90-pound woman in her late 70s, Marion's demeanor and life experiences made the program a success. Her non-judgmental approach allowed offenders the freedom to talk openly, giving her access to the parts of their mind open to change. Let us go back to the first time and think of when Marion arrived in Alabama in 1965. I have to tell you that in her journal, she enjoyed the scenery and the southern hospitality that she heard about as she was going there. However, the door was slammed shut by signs revealing the human climate of Alabama, such as signs that read, whites only colored entrance, and newspaper, newspaper headings stating, black shot here for fishing at white man's lake. And at the end of the summer, Poncho's words, y'all coming back next summer? We know they have remained with Marion for all the years, as did her mission. Prior to Marion and David's move to Spencer, David admitted he was leery about starting over. Would a small town in Iowa be accepting of a black man and his white wife? David's insecurity slowly faded as he noted people in Iowa helped him without wanting anything in return. And one of those people is Leslie Pullman here that helped him with not knowing their story, just to be kind. And the very move that caused David the most anxiety became the place where he discovered a newfound belief in the goodness of mankind. The possibility of loving thy neighbors regardless of the color of one's skin became a reality for the first time for David right here in the state of Iowa in our town of Spencer. Just as Marion always believed would happen in Iowa during the Civil Rights Movement, many ordinary citizens, such as, such as my Aunt Mary and Helen, took great risks to seek ways for America to change. The Civil Rights Movement was the key turning point in Marion's life mission. Her hopes, though, were that the resolution would just be a few years away. However, as we know, that mission continues today. In 2020, we lost three of Marion's mentors, Joseph Lowry, C.T. Vivian, John Robert Lewis, making it appropriate to end Marion's memoir with John Robert Lewis's oxymoron, Good Trouble, as such words encourage us to strive for peaceful change. Just a few days before the exhibit was set to open, I decided to read one of Marion's books from her last home library here in Spencer. I wanted to feel I was in her headspace upon opening the exhibit. So I chose this John Lewis book that you see pictured here. And then I opened the cover <laughs> to an inscription. To Marion, thank you for all your good work. Keep the faith. Best wishes, John Lewis. December 3rd, 1999. He knew Marion, <laughs> or she knew him. Throughout her lifetime, Marion stressed the power of words. During MLK Poor's, MLK's Poor People Campaign in 1968, Marion saw and photographed this sign at Resurrection City on the DC lawn. These words, so you think you're on the outside looking in, inspired our memoir title. We wonder if the people walking by understood the irony of those words as they stood outside the fence, witnessing from afar, Poor People's Campaign. Marion made it her life mission to ensure that no one felt that he or she was on the outside looking in by feeling excluded from a group, a process, or an opportunity. In the words of 17-year-old Marion, 
I'll take again from her high school valedictorian speech, which they have that here in her handwriting. As November 7th, and her words, let me go back to her, her words were, it has always been man's greatest ambition to leave a better world behind when the final curtain is drawn. As November 17th, 2018, drew the final curtain on Marion's life, Marion left behind a better world. Marion believed that people should give every human the same rights that they declare for themselves. But Marion saw herself as a human and not a hero. In her lifetime, Marion bore witness to the endless atrocities that stained our collective consciousness and worked with other visionaries to inspire our youth to march towards a brighter, more equitable future. Unveiling the truth and breaking free of rigid boxes will help disseminate the long-standing prejudice. To learn more about Marion's story, Purchase our memoir right here at the Clay County Heritage Center with the proceeds going to support future exhibits. Moreover, until mid-December, Marion's artifacts will be on display here at the Clay County Heritage Center with the goal of reaching historians, educators, students, and citizens across the Midwest. These primary sources dating back over a century will widen your perspective on how far we have come, but how far we have to go. A special heartfelt thanks to the exhibit sponsors, and this list is continuing to change since I did this. We also want to thank the Spencer Library for collaborating with the museum and helping the community expand their knowledge on Marion's mission through further reading options. The library also has two copies of our memoir available for checkout as well. And we, I'd be remiss if I did not thank hy -Vee. My husband, my husband retired from there. Scott Threlkeld, though, he's, he's making learning for Spencer history a priority by covering all the museum admission fees. So when you come here, that is, it's covered. Marion's influence lives on, though. We found an old photo of Marion with her Waldorf College roommate. And through an investigation, we put a name to her face, Isla Brum. And in time and a twist of faith so common in Iowa, I got to meet Isla's daughter. So the two of us traveled to Forest City, where her, where my dear aunt and my mother both went to college as well as her dear mother, and we decided to walk their footsteps. Waldorf chose to publish this story in the spring of 2022 edition of the Waldorf magazine. My sister and I knew we wanted to read a book about Marion, but the book needed to be written. Our mother became our inspiration. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, great. And wanting this memoir about her sister shared with the world. So with mom's encouragement, we became writers and not waiters. You need to think about what narratives you might have to share with the world. Thank you for letting me share Aunt Marian's story, our writing steps, and the importance of books. And I'm going to borrow a quote right from Jeffrey Perrell's post after reading Marion's obituary. What a life, what a woman, what a human being. And I was blessed to have her be my aunt. Thank you for coming today. <laughs> and I'll go back to that. Are there any questions you might have before I turn this back to Shelby? Will there be a sequel <laughs> with all those boxes <laughs> in storage? Yeah. Yes, um, as Braden shared, uh, of the, the 50 boxes, I was able to narrow it down to 22 boxes before bringing it here. And he feels like if he were to put it into boxes, he probably in the exhibits only maybe four to five of her boxes, of her buckets. So there's, other, there's so much more to her than just her civil rights work, actually. But... Okay. What happens to her records once? That's where we're at right now. Um, that's what we're trying, Shelby's working with me. If it would be a traveling exhibit across Iowa, we, we do have her Minnesota students and her um, activist co-worker, they would like it there. And I, and I feel like it needs to all stay together. Um, I know that there's a ways it would separate, and I, I don't think I want that to happen. Yes? I, maybe I missed this. Was she ever married, or did she have a... Marion married. 
Yeah. Yes, this is, this is her husband, David, <laughs> um, they, and, which is another whole history. Yes, because as of 1967, you could not marry somebody of a different color, um, and they got married in 1972. Do you do it on purpose or because she fell in love, do you think? Oh, their story is they were put on a blind date. We don't know if they knew that they were of different color, but David likes to share that he heard her walking down the hallway and knew he was going to marry her from her footsteps. <laughs> and, that, and so much so, he kept, they kept the outfit that they met each other in, and she's buried in that outfit now. Oh. Yeah. Which, they're, which they are both buried at Spencer, at the cemetery at um, North Spencer. Again, to choose a place they were not from tells you what the last year and a half of their life must have felt like here in Spencer. And Leslie, no, you were there from the start of, I'm sure you witnessed David's fear. You know, and it, but it uh, it just changed as as the time went on, and you realize people did, and because Leslie was one of the people, he'd say, "What's the angle here? She's doing things and not asking to be paid." You know, I mean, it just always thought people had an angle going if they were nice. So, yeah, it was three weeks at the hotel until their house house um, opened up here in Spencer. Yeah. Yeah, their house sold in a weekend in, um, in the city. I have a feeling they were taken advantage of as an elderly couple. Well, in fact, I know that. Um, and to move everything in a week's time, and really it was just David and two other men moving the things because Marianne was quite frail at that time. Nancy was here in her early days. Marianne was really, especially really frail when she got here. Very much here, you know, very much with it here. But to leave every, I mean, that was their home of all of their, but David knew Marianne needed to be closer to her mom. I mean, to her sister, my mom, and her brother Orville. Um, mom was in Spirit Lake, and Orville and, and Cylinder. So he made that sacrifice. So yeah, so I, it wasn't it wasn't about color when they married. Um, I'm sure they would have maybe chose something different because there was a lot, a lot happened for those two to be married in 1972 and what they went through. They were married pretty late in life. Yes, Marion was 45. Yes, David had two daughters. Um, uh, that we did get to meet when they moved here to Spencer, um, who loved Marion dearly. Um, and that was, and they got to also see, they were fearful, they wanted their dad to move to Grand Rapids, Michigan. They didn't think a small town could take, could take this, could handle this. But they fell, they fell in love with the people of Spencer too. Um, I'm glad they got to see that too. Hmm. Have you been able to develop any personal connections to Gadsden, Alabama? We were going to go there this summer and didn't make it. No, not yet, but do you have a connection? No. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's we our... We go through Alabama. Oh, you know, yeah. But... Yeah, we, yeah, that was going to be our plan, and we just didn't get it taken care of this summer. We flew instead of driving, but it will be there. I mean, that's, yeah, that and, yeah, in Mississippi, too. Yeah, Columbia, we'd like to get there, too, but, yeah. Do you hope to write any more books about that? Um, this wasn't on the DACA to start with, but <laughs> uh, but I know Pam would like to. Pam is I'm more the researcher, and Pam is the is the writer. She probably say differently, but um, she's the one that helps. I mean, comes up with these, and and then I just practice being the reader. <laughs> but uh, she would like to. Yes, she feels that that passion very dearly, um, and there each chapter of of, their, of her book really could be its own. You know, Mary, you know, you've kind of told, we talked about that too, how I know you're working on a sequel for your, your own book, yeah. But it's, be a movie. well, we talked about Meryl Streep playing Mary. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But David had already said if there was a movie, he's, it was Sidney Poitier. That was, <laughs> so that was, he and I had that, we both liked Sidney Poitier, we would talk about. Did you uh, continue the teaching profession? Did I? Yeah. I um, retired, um, just, well, would it be four years ago now? I re retired right before we um, wrote this book. Um, yes. And my, my plan was David passed away uh, four months before Marion, and that wasn't the plan. He thought he was bringing her here and then found out he had cancer, um, and Abin was amazing. But he died four, four months before Marion. So my plan was to retire and take care of Marion. And I told Marion in November, we had to tell by November 1st that I was tired, retired. I said, what are you doing? You don't need to retire. And so I'd like, I'd like to have time with, 
with you. And she said, you won't need to be taking care of me. She passed away November 17th. But the timing for when school would start that next fall was the exact day that my mom went into the hospital and needed me. And I wouldn't have had that year with her. So I think Marion was already looking out for her little sister, as she did her whole life. Marion and Orville just, they totally took care of my mom. They totally made her path be as easy as they could, other than she had five daughters, I can't imagine, <laughs> raising, but, but other than that. But <laughs> well, I hope each of you grab somebody to come to the museum and go through um, there too. They did a great job, and Shelby with the background for the sponsorships, I know that's always a battle to get things sponsored. And, um, any other questions? Otherwise, I will stay afterward, and um, you can ask me questions there, too. But I know I'm going to turn it over to Shelby. Yeah, um, so for those of you who have come to Lunch and Learns before, you've done this, um, but I'll ask you to do it again. There are note cards on all the tables. If you could fill in the blank, my community shares blank, uh, you can write a word, a phrase, whatever you'd like. Um, and I'm create, creating like a word cloud of all the different answers that we've gathered this year. You can just take a minute to write down 